let's see what the Alzheimer's Association has to say about Alzheimer's disease versus age-associated memory impairment. You might ask yourself, my mom's having a lot of these senior moments. How do I know the difference between a lot of senior moments versus something much more serious like Alzheimer's disease? So the Alzheimer's Association gives us 10 warning signs to look for. The first is memory loss. And if you're taking notes either here in the classroom or you're taking notes at home, I want you to find a little pen, a little piece of paper, and I want you to write the word joggable. Joggable. The question is, is this memory joggable? So for instance, I've met Jack. I've met Jack a few days ago, correct? He walks into this room and I look at him and go, oh, buggers. I don't know this guy from anybody. Jack comes and introduces himself. He says, I'm Jack. You know, I work at Morningside Ministries. I picked you up the other morning. I drove you across town to where you were going. If he can jog my memory and I say, oh, Jack, yeah, I'm sorry. Of course I know you, Jack. If he can jog my memory, I'm okay. I just had a little, oops, a little brain fart, a little senior moment. <laughs> I mean, young people have senior moments, too. Sometimes we get tired. Sometimes we get overstressed or overworked. There's a lot of things that cause those little oopses. But if Jack can jog my memory, I'm okay. I just had a little oops. If Jack cannot jog my memory, if I look at Jack and say, uh-uh, buddy boy, you didn't pick me up. That wasn't you. I don't remember ever driving across town with you. I've never seen you before. Well, now, there's something really significant happening with me cognitively. If I don't remember Jack, even after he's strongly tried to jog my memory. The second warning sign the Alzheimer's Association provides is difficulty performing familiar tasks. What do we mean by difficulty performing familiar tasks? I worked with a fellow many, many years ago. Maybe he was 71, 72 years old. He lived in a memory cottage where I was an aide. And his wife asked me if on the mornings that I worked, would I make him his favorite breakfast? I was 19 years old. I could barely pour cereal. <laughs> I could barely get a bowl of cornflakes out successfully. But his wife, Marie, asked, she said, please, Aaron, she said, the mornings you work, would you make Charlie his favorite breakfast? Would you make him the two eggs over easy, the, the piece of wheat toast, the half grapefruit, the cup of hot black coffee, the orange juice? And I, I said, I would. I really, I, I said I would. And then every day after that, I gave him cornflakes. <laughs> I gave him cornflakes. I, I wasn't successful. And I tell you what, I brought out those cornflakes to Charlie every morning that I worked, and Charlie's face would light up and he'd say, hey, babe, thank you. Boy, thank you, hon. And he would dive into those cornflakes. So I thought, I thought this is okay. Well, one morning I had a little extra time, and I had practiced flipping eggs back at my little apartment. And one morning I was successful. One morning... I made Charlie's favorite breakfast. It was, I thought, something that should go on the cover of Good Housekeeping. <laughs> and I brought that plate, and my little 19-year-old heart was just bursting. I felt pretty proud of myself. And I put it down in front of Charlie, and Charlie lit up like he did every morning, and he said, hey, babe, thanks a lot. That's he's such a good girl. And with that, I said, enjoy your breakfast, and I was off to care for the other fellows that I cared for in this small cottage. I came back about 20 minutes later, and the Charlie that I knew, uh, that lovable, adorable, gracious man that I knew, wasn't there. It was, it was really a different Charlie altogether. This Charlie was, was angry. He was cursing. He had all his silverware balled up in his hands like this. And he was cursing, saying these blankety blank blank things don't work. They just don't work. Why did that blankety blank blank give these to me? And when I came in and he saw me cross the room. He threw that silverware at me for all he was worth. Wow. Um, his plate was untouched. His eggs were cold. Coffee was cold. When you think about performing familiar tasks, every day I've given him a bowl of cornflakes. That's a pretty simple task. Taking that spoon, 
scooping up the cereal. That's one task. But how many tasks are involved in a big, complicated breakfast? Eggs that have to be broken apart, and then toast that has to be picked up, and then grapefruit that has to be scooped out. Those are a lot of tasks. And in fact, what's typically lost in Alzheimer's disease isn't the ability to do those simple tasks. It's the ability to string them together in their logical sequence and in their logical order. I was blessed, really, to have mentors who taught me after that how I could provide Charlie with his favorite breakfast by providing him items maybe one at a time or being there to cue him and start him. A person who's having regular old senior moments, they're not going to forget how to eat their favorite breakfast. A person with Alzheimer's disease may in fact forget how to eat their favorite breakfast. The third point or the third warning sign that the Alzheimer's Association provides us is problems with language. What do we mean by problems with language? There seems to be a trend that for people who get Alzheimer's disease, they lose certain words. A lot of times they lose nouns. So they'll trail off a lot. If they're looking for a pen, they'll say things like, hand me that, that um, oh, hand me that, you know, you know, you know, that thing, that thing, that thing in the jig, that what you may call it. That happens to all of us but it doesn't happen all of the time. It's a real pronounced pattern with Alzheimer's disease. Sometimes we see unusual word substitutions. I worked with a fellow in Michigan who repeatedly asked his caregivers, she said, I want some more of that white water. Give me some more of that white water. And what was he asking for? Milk. Yeah. Milk. Absolutely. His word had substituted that, or his mind had substituted that word. My husband is, he's a smidgen older than me. So what I do is I carry around this list in my back pocket. <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready for any warning sign at a moment's notice. And we traveled to a, a, a beautiful historical hotel in, in Spokane, Washington, where I was teaching a class. And we walked into this beautiful historical hotel, and there was a very elegant chandelier hanging down. And we'd never seen anything like it. We were awestruck. And as my husband gazed up upon that chandelier, it, he said to me with, with, in a very earnest way, he said, oh, Aaron, he said, look at that light hanging down the thing. <laughs> <laughs> the light hanging down the thing, and I whipped out my list, and I said, ooh, number three. <laughs> Unusual word substitutions. <laughs> I know that you're all familiar with some of these classic signs of Alzheimer's disease, disorientation to time and place. I met a lady in Montana. A beautiful southern accent. And I asked her, you know, sitting in, in Montana, I wasn't expecting that beautiful southern accent. I said, Where are you from? And she crossed her arms rather uh, indignantly and she said, Well, right here, Knoxville, Tennessee. Where do you think I'm from? <laughs> Knoxville, Tennessee. I become Billings, Montana. It's that type of disorientation to time and place, not just simply forgetting the date or forgetting the day. I mean, I forget the date and the day all the time. But I usually know when I'm in Knoxville, Tennessee versus Billings, Montana. Or decreased judgment. I visited with an adult daughter. She said the first time she knew there was something really wrong with her mom is when she went to pick up her mom for Thanksgiving. She lived in a different city from her mom, and she'd been checking in with her mom uh, by the telephone. And she walked into her mom's house and was hit by a terrible odor. It was overwhelming the whole house. And she went to search and find out what on earth was causing this terrible odor. She finally found, stashed under her mom's bed, uh, an enormous collection of, of jack-o'-lanterns that were remaining from Halloween. It seems that her mom had gone up and down her little street in her little town and gathered up those jack-o'-lanterns and stored them under her bed. Those jack-o'-lanterns had been there for weeks. We're talking about that level of poor or decreased judgment. Other signs or possible warning signs would be problems with abstract thinking, misplacing things. Again, if you're taking notes either here or in this class or you're taking notes uh, from a distance learning site, I would like you to write down that it is the unusual misplacement of items the very unusual misplacement of items. I don't want anyone to think that if you just put your keys in a dumb spot that suddenly oh, you've got number seven. <laughs> we all put our keys in dumb spots, but it's unlikely that we're going to take our car keys, wrap them up in saran wrap, 
put them in the sugar bowl, put the sugar bowl inside the oven, that's unusual. That's a sign that something, something's going wrong. Number eight, changes in mood or behavior are very, very common with Alzheimer's disease. Changes in personality and finally loss of initiative. I want to be real clear for anybody watching this telecast that these 10 warning signs are not a diagnostic tool. I do make some jokes about it. <laughs> I usually make jokes at my husband's expense. And as much as I would like to watch him for these signs and symptoms, I won't ever be able to diagnose him or diagnose anyone. These 10 warning signs are just that, warning signs that mean we should get our loved one to a physician. A, a physician is qualified to figure out exactly what is going on.